And thank you so much for joining us today. We'll be talking about nursing home naloxone policy and procedure toolkit. And we have the, the great Robert Aceta who's going to talk about that. So next slide, please. As you can see here, Alliant Health Solutions covers seven states in the Southeast. A little bit about myself. I'm a pharmacist by training. I lead all the opioid work for Alliant and I do the ADE work as well. So if you have any questions or concerns about that, feel free to contact me. Today, our speaker is Robert C. Aceta. He is a senior pharmacist in IPRO's Healthcare Quality Improvement Department. He is a board member and fellow of the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists the national organization advocating for pharmacists provided excellence in senior care medication management. He graduated with a degree in pharmacy from St. John's University in Jamaica, New York. I'm actually going to turn it over to Rob at this point so he can talk about his learning objectives and more information on that toolkit. Thank you. Well, hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Tanya, for introducing me today. And now let's talk a little bit about our learning objectives for the session today. Uh, so we want to provide an overview of this uh, nursing home naloxone toolkit, uh, review some policies that you can implement uh, in your facility, um, and they can be revised, of course, to meet the needs of your organization or facility, and also to promote preparedness by incorporating naloxone, which, of course, is a life-saving drug, and assuring its availability for folks who need it. So the Nursing Home Naloxone Policy and Procedure Toolkit uh, was coordinated and worked uh, through a group of stakeholders in the IPRO Quinn QIO region, which uh, consists of the Northeast part of the country, uh, Albany, uh, sorry, New York, New Jersey, Ohio, Maryland, Delaware, Washington, DC, and the New England states. And, um, <clears throat> The representatives in the uh, organization in the work group included the following folks, folks from the Greater New York Healthcare Facilities Association in New York, the Northeast Ohio Hospital Opioid Consortium uh, from the Center for Health Affairs in Cleveland, uh, the New York Medical Directors Association and University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. Um, we had an expert on uh, harm reduction from the University of Rhode Island College of Pharmacy in Kingston, Rhode Island. And of course, we had the IPRO team and staff and pr practicing consultant pharmacists also contributed. So the genesis and the need assessment uh, for the toolkit. Well, of course, we had the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services or CMS uh, release revisions to the State Operations Manual, uh, Appendix PP, for the guidance to surveyors. And a draft copy of that guidance was released in June of 2022, uh, which provided ample time for folks to review all of the changes and the guidance uh, specifically around uh, opioids and uh, adverse drug events and harm reduction. The effective date for that change would was October 24th of 22. Um, we had a new emphasis, although existing information already uh, was available uh, on the opioid crisis and caring for residents with the substance use disorder and opioid use disorder in particular. And there were recommendations to facilities to include references uh, about naloxone. So the state operations manual, um, appendix PP, and here's just some highlights from that a specific verbiage, but according to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration, uh, opioid overdose deaths could be prevented by administering naloxone, uh, which is a medication approved by the Food and Drug Administration to reverse the effects of opioids. And again, the U.S. Surgeon General had recommended that naloxone be kept on hand uh, when there is a risk of an opioid overdose. And the takeaway here really, and, and that's in red, that facilities should have a written policy to address opioid overdose. And so when we were looking at that, we realized that many facilities did not have such a policy, didn't have any guidance. And that's where we uh, came together to produce this toolkit. So our gap analysis, again, research led by the IPRO Queen QIO team and other organizations that participated, nursing home residents were at increased risk 
or the opioid overdose deaths by both prescription and illicit substances being brought into facilities. Emergency drug kits or the automated dispensing system laws uh, vary from state to state. And in many cases, they hadn't been updated or revised in a long time. Not every nursing home carried naloxone, believe it or not, as an emergency drug in the emergency kits. Um, and then naloxone product availability uh, was available in several options, um, but it's kind of difficult for facilities and folks to use naloxone if there weren't any policies or protocols in place, absent from a specific doctor's order. Um, and then finally, accessibility to naloxone um, by the staff who needed to provide it had to be prioritized. So now let's take a look at the toolkit um, and provide a little bit of an overview for you. So the content will include assessments and policies as it states as a policy and procedure guide and toolkit. And I want to reinforce for all of you on the call that, you know, these are uh, documents that we've vetted through our committee, our work group, stakeholder group, but they are not set in stone. You can take these policies, you can take these resources, and you should take them, review them, you know, have all the members of your team review them, including your uh, medical director, your administrator, your consultant pharmacist, director of nursing, review them and see what's appropriate for your organization or facility, and then use them as a starting point to make appropriate adjustments and implement what you would like to incorporate. At the end of the presentation, I'm gonna share with you an opportunity that we had with an Ohio nursing home. We actually incorporated uh, the toolkit and we'll give you some guidance on how we did it. So here, the content includes um, some resources for assessing residents. We'll go over those in a moment. Uh, naloxone education and competency policy and procedure. Um, a naloxone use, again, how to use the naloxone um, product by whatever um, selection your facility chooses to have on board. Uh, we also incorporated a standing order for use of naloxone for folks. Um, again, we'll talk about that. Suspected overdose drill policy. So it's very important not only to have the material, have the naloxone, but to practice if you need to use it. So we incorporated a procedure for that. And then at the end, we have selected resources. Uh, it's very important to incorporate this uh, information in this slide in particular, that because there's more sub more than one substance other than opioids um, that folks may be using that is illicit, um, we wanted to remind folks this toolkit really addresses opioid overdoses only. And um, the information we see now uh, really comes from an FDA media guide um, that was sent out in early February that um, speaks to other illicit medications or other illicit drugs. So if naloxone doesn't work after multiple attempts, um, the loss of consciousness could be due to some other drug. And xylazine, which is a veterinary drug that is um, unfortunately available on the street, uh, it is not an opioid. And there is currently, uh, it's not known to be reversed by naloxone. So this is one example of a situation where folks may be using xylazine or another illicit drug where this uh, rescue medication naloxone will not work. So again, healthcare professionals should consider potential xylazine exposure when uh, patients are presenting with an overdose and they don't respond to one or two doses of naloxone. And of course, healthcare providers should provide supportive measures uh, and consider screening for xylazine using, by using appropriate tests when they're available. So this is the introductory narrative to the toolkit. Um, again, Kind of like three bullet points, CMS identified the need to improve guidance related to meeting the unique health care needs of residents with mental health diagnoses and substance use disorder. Um, facility staff uh, should know the signs and symptoms uh, of possible substance use, uh, and that's incorporated in training right, for all facility employees and, and uh, consultants who would come to facilities. We do discuss that uh, to address emergencies such as an overdose. So it incorporates increasing monitoring, administering naloxone, uh, initiating CPR as appropriate, uh, and contacting emergen emergency medical services. And then uh, the toolkit again is intended to provide as an easy to uh, provide an easy to adapt policy and procedure for facilities that didn't have anything or needed to implement something to improve their emergency response to opioid overdoses. 
So how to use the kit, the goal again of the work group was to provide these easily accessible and customizable policies. Um, the toolkit includes evidence-based recommendations for responding to um, opioid-induced respiratory depression. Uh, the example policies and procedures, again, they're there for you to review and edit, uh, to use, uh, to meet the needs of your organization. And we did include several, again, resources at the very end that discusses all of the different appropriate um, resources for use. Um, this is a snapshot to show you what a policy and procedure uh, looked like uh, in the toolkit. And really it's to promote leadership responsibility uh, for use of these policies. And you can see this is a, an attempt for you to customize this policy. Uh, and this sample uses uh, an opportunity for you to add your facility name um, in your facility logo, and then for accountability. And we do, again, stress that administrators, medical directors, directors of nursing, and your consultant pharmacist should be involved when you incorporate uh, the material in this toolkit. Um, and the procedure responsible parties, you would again find who would be the most responsible uh, party that you would want to incorporate. Uh, and then we also listed uh, particular related policies that you would find in the toolkit. And we even included, if you look on the uh, left hand side, the applicable um, regulation or standard in Appendix PP where this would be appropriate. So we kind of have all of that loaded for you to use. So the first one I'd like to talk about uh, today is a resource, uh, the Reassort and Opioid Risk Tool Revised. And so the policy statement begins with all residents, and again, up to your facility, all residents with new opioid orders and not on a comfort measure only plan uh, would be assessed for risk for overdose or serious opioid induced respiratory depression using the Reassort tool. Uh, and for risk for opioid use disorder uh, using the opioid risk tool revised. So here uh, in this slide, we've given you a snapshot of what the tool looks like. And again, the risk index uh, for overdose um, or serious opioid uh, induced respiratory depression. So very simple questions. You are able to answer these questions and provide some uh, a scale response. You calculate a scale. And then you can see on the right-hand side, um, we have the um, calculation to give you some guidance. And then this particular tool is the opioid uh, risk tool to assess for uh, the risk for developing an opioid use disorder. So these would be for folks who maybe have not had the use of opioids in your facility. Uh, um, and someone wishes to start them. This is a really helpful tool. Again, looking at particular risk assessment, answering questions, coming up with a score, and then using the uh, score. Uh, we also included a morphine milligram equivalent calculation conversion chart based upon the different products that are available uh, that are opioids that might be prescribed. And you can see what the conversion factors are for uh, to provide equivalency for dosing uh, to morphine. So this is another helpful tool for you to use and incorporate. Um, our next policy, we'll discuss the naloxone uh, education and competency. So for a policy statement, all nursing home facility staff, again, it's up to your facility to decide who would receive the education. Uh, will receive naloxone education and competency assessment upon hire and annually. And then we thought that was the appropriate time frame. And this would, again, be the opportunity to incorporate uh, consultants and vendors as indicated in your facility. And so here we created a naloxone administration uh, competency assessment. And again, you're looking at various questions. This is all available in the toolkit um, to see whether or not the person would be considered competent after the education, whether they need to have an additional session. And this material could be uh, kept in a personnel file if you'd like to do that. Our next policy, again, specifically, we talk about naloxone use. Uh, so we, this is a little deeper dive into the naloxone product that you may wish to carry in your facility. Uh, so it would be uh, based upon a policy statement that you would uh, edit uh, if you feel it's appropriate to do that. So upon a physician's medication order per a resident specific uh, or facility standing order, which we will share later, uh, naloxone may be administered by a licensed nurse or authorized staff 
to residents, patients, staff, or visitors, as indicated, uh, for complete or partial reversal of suspected opioid-induced respiratory depression. Again, up to your facility to decide how you want to incorporate this. And so here we give some guidance in the toolkit about folks who may be suspected, uh, who may be having uh, opioid-induced respiratory depression and folks who might be at risk. So we have a couple of slides here to review. Um, persons with recent inpatient hospitalization who are suspected opioid overdose, someone who may have had a diagnosis of opioid use disorder, someone with a history of opioid use or dependence, or a diagnosed substance use disorder, persons with current prescribed opioid orders uh, may be afflicted, persons with current prescribed opioid and benzodiazepine orders. We know that's a high risk, high alert combination because of the increased risk of respiratory depression. Folks who have had uh, past opioid use and have been justice involved uh, at the facility, persons with comorbid diseases that may adversely affect their respiratory status, uh, current or recent registrant of a methadone maintenance program or a detox program, uh, visitors, and this is a concern also, friends and family members of any of the above folks who may visit the resident and bring in illegal, illicit, or prescription opioids uh, for that person. And finally, residents who frequently attempt to elope or leave the facility premises. These are all folks who may be uh, at risk, at increased risk. So here, our next slide, uh, we talk about procedure for administering naloxone and nasal spray. We uh, recognize the brand name Narcan. We provide information here from the FDA. So I think, again, uh, not to belabor it, this is how we would administer it. And just for reference, usually the naloxone nasal spray would be provided either in your emergency kit. It would be available uh, in uh, dosages of two. It usually comes in a box with two sprays one to allow the first dose and one to allow a repeat dose if necessary. So we'll move on to the next slide, which will talk about procedure for administering uh, naloxone solution for intramuscular injection. And again, more facilities have recently been adapting the naloxone nasal spray, uh, but many facilities still incorporate naloxone injection as the product they would prefer to have, especially in their emergency drug kits, or in their automated dispensing systems. And of course that depends upon your state regulations. Um, so again, this talks about how to uh, prepare the uh, naloxone solution for injection. Um, we do have a reference here for you, uh, prescribing reference and information there for that. Um, another policy that uh, folks have incorporated or have used uh, for consideration is a standing order policy. And I would refer you to your individual state regulations about standing orders for naloxone. But um, here again, this policy talks about having a physician's medication order per resident or a standing order. Naloxone may be administered by a licensed nurse or authorized staff. Again, for residents, patients, staff or visitors as indicated for the complete or partial reversal of a suspected opioid-induced respiratory depression. And here, again, we uh, the work group created this uh, standing order um, template for use for uh, naloxone for residents, staff, or visitors. <clears throat> and so again, the indication on responsiveness and or difficulty breathing due to suspected opioid-induced respiratory depression uh, some exclusions, folks were very concerned about excluding uh, and, and making known that some folks um, should be uh, addressed. So we have listed some of those exclusions uh, if it's appropriate for those folks. And then to order and how to order the uh, naloxone. And then of course, there's a line there for your medical director to sign and date. Our next policy speaks about a suspected overdose drill. So um, we would like to incorporate training and uh, a drill. And so this policy statement discusses uh, how an over overdose drill can help prepare staff to respond quickly um, and with confidence 
to potentially save a life. And I think this is really a key point for all of us. Not only is it, again, important to have it available, but we should practice. And in nursing home uh, care, we do practice many uh, different uh, life-saving drills. And this could be one of them that your facility would like to incorporate. So um, we have, uh, you know, the statement that says announcing an overdose drill ahead of time could prevent panic, fear, and confusion. So folks realize that this is a drill only and it's not a really life-saving, uh, threatening situation. Uh, the facility would identify a response team. And again, by shift, not just one shift. And then typically we focus on the daytime shift, but something to incorporate across all the shifts. And of course, to incorporate at least one licensed nurse and at least one or prefer preferably two the other staff members. And then the drill should be, con again, our team thought it would be appropriate to have this at least annually and as needed. So in the toolkit, we incorporated this uh, checklist. So we would have that information there. I would uh, you know, recommend that you review the information, typically what you would do in a drill. And it does provide uh, some tips for overdose reversal using naloxone. So we do have this in the drill, again, reviewing um, signs and symptoms, how to respond to an overdose, make sure that we, uh, we reach out to calling uh, emergency services 911. Um, and then to administer the naloxone in this uh, particular portion of the toolkit, we incorporated, and you see this in red actually, a section for you to customize uh, the type of naloxone that you would use in your facility. So once your team decides which product you'd like to use, you can, of course, select either the injection, uh, a naloxone auto, inje auto injector, which is now available, uh, the naloxone nasal spray, the typical strength that we would see is the four milligram nasal spray. And there is also an eight milligram nasal spray uh, available. And then again, some effects to evaluate, and then aftercare, after uh, the, the person has received the dosing. And then of course, we would recommend uh, that not only you do the drill, but then you do a, a review after the drill and see what could be done better to improve for the next time. Our next slide here, we start to go into the resources. And so I just wanna share this with you. You can have uh, time uh, on your own uh, time to review the resources. We have these from uh, the federal government, uh, some CMS resources here. Our next slide talks uh, to life support. Uh, and so this would be um, information directly for uh, CPR, uh, specifically for uh, healthcare providers. We also have naloxone training uh, information for healthcare providers and how naloxone saves lives. This, this particular uh, reference is available also in the um, IPROQUIN QIO library. So there's a reference for that there. Uh, we incorporated uh, resources for opioid crisis, understanding the opioid overdose crisis and CMS roadmap to address the crisis and then pain and opioid guidelines. And there's so many of them out there. We, you know, again, tried to be selective in which to incorporate in the toolkit to get you started. So we did that. And then we have multiple resources, again, understanding substance use disorder, a lot of resources available out there. So again, uh, we have some particularly interesting resources, uh, particularly about stigma and discrimination. I thought that was really important to incorporate. So some of our team members, uh, incorporated those uh, into the toolkit. So next, I want to talk about how we implemented this. I mentioned this to you earlier, uh, that we had a group in Ohio, and we looked to see how we can incorporate this into a facility. And we took the toolkit. We had a, a doctoral capstone student working with us uh, from Ohio. And we uh, incorporated this into a facility of 126 beds, uh, here you can see some information about the facility. This was uh, presented in March. Um, and the collaboration was with uh, the director of nursing, uh, the director of the facility, uh, the administrator role, and the pharmacist and the consultant pharmacist. So we did uh, have implementation through in-service. And here we gave uh, a kind of overview to the facility folks uh, that would be providing the information. And you can see information here, description about uh, the team that prepared it, 
free education knowledge survey uh, was provided, introduction of the toolkit and policies to give folks time to decide which policies they wanted to implement, the assessment tools, we had training about those tools, the overview of naloxone administration, we did have a short video to demonstrate a naloxone nasal spray, uh, and again, reviewing the tip sheet on how to use naloxone, and then questions in a post-assessment knowledge survey. I want to be sensitive to the time, so uh, I want to just give you an overview here. We did have a pre-education knowledge survey, and um, again, we had 27 participants who participated. We had uh, various age ranges for folks that participated in this, uh, and then all participants were asked to complete a pre-education knowledge survey before the presentation began. I think that's important to see where we stand. Uh, and so there's a pre-knowledge check. And then these are questions that were asked pre and post. So before and after, we talked about uh, that the CMS had recommended um, incorporating naloxone to be administered to facility residents and staff and so on. Uh, what to do in the case where the person who's receiving naloxone did not respond. So we have a pre-survey uh, and a post-survey improvement. Um, when using the opioid risk tool um, revised, we wanted to understand were folks available uh, to um, see whether or not this was helpful. And again, pre-survey, not uh, to, to see that some folks needed a little more education and post-survey. And then... Um, Providing information about the naloxone solution and how to administer this, where to administer it. So pre and post survey, the education component was really important. Uh, and then finally, when administering the naloxone nasal spray, where should you spray it? Uh, it should be into both nostrils or one. And so we gave that pre survey and post survey. And so the takeaway here, the findings uh, at the project, we had a very important uh, improved knowledge gain overall for the folks who participated. This shows that the um, folks really did uh, recognize the presenter when they were presenting this information to them. And then out of this work group, we incorporated and created an implementation checklist. So this is also available. Um, you can see the link there on the slide, but this is an actual nursing home checklist that you could use in your facility. Take it, take a look at it, see what information would be most appropriate for you to get started if you wanted to use this checklist and toolkit. So in summary, uh, the toolkit is an easy to use resource. Uh, implementation of the policies in the toolkit help the facilities meet CMS state operations manual requirements, and the facility staff will be better prepared to care for an individual having an opiate overdose emergency. And then for more information, uh, I think I would like to turn it over to our host. So I want to thank you for your time and allowing me to present this to you on behalf of Alliant today. Thank you. If there are any questions, if you can place them in chat, I don't see anything right this moment. Um, I did see the, the link for the slides is there. I'm going to continue speaking um, until I, unless I hear or see any questions. So like he was saying, for more information, feel free to contact myself, Tanya Vidala, or Jennifer Massey. Um, Rob's contact information is there too. If, if you really needed to speak with him as well. And there's a link to resource library and the toolkit so you can actually see it. As always, CMS 12th scope of work covers opioid utilization and misuse, patient safety, chronic disease, self-management, care coordination, COVID-19, immunizations, and training. If you need any coverage for your state or your area, Julie Keeker covers Alabama, Florida, and Louisiana. Leanne Sells covers Georgia, Kentucky, North Carolina, and Tennessee. And as always, you can find Alliant Health on your favorite social media, whether that be Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or YouTube. I don't see any questions, so I'm going to give a big thank you so much, Rob, for speaking today and going through um, how to use this toolkit. Thank you so much.